Welcome to Evolving Door, the podcast where I interview guests about the moments in their lives that have really moved them forwards, where they had a significant shift in their thinking, their awareness, and their understanding about life in all its various aspects. Join me and expect to be enlivened, enriched, and inspired on your personal journey of evolution. Welcome back to Evolving Door. This is episode two. It's with Jolyon Rubenstein. He's a British actor, writer, producer, director, and this is a two-parter as well, and it's a really great cliffhanger. So I'm sure you'll be tuning in for part two as well. I first came across Jolyon um, when I saw him in The Revolution Will Be Televised, which was a sort of comedy sketch show on BBC Three. So, so funny, but also really really hard hitting and looking at some really serious political issues. I warn you in this episode uh, there are a couple of attempts by me at doing uh, the accents of some of the characters Uh, so if you're not sure what I'm talking about I definitely recommend you should go and check out uh, the series. It's uh, they actually did three series in the end. It's absolutely genius work and there is another little warning also there is some sort of explicit language in both parts as well. So if you've got young people around, just be aware. I want to say a huge thank you to all of you who've already been listening and have tuned into the trailer and episode one uh, with Janavi Harrison. If you haven't, please make sure you go back and listen to them both. It was a really, really uh, powerful episode. And um, the thing that's coming through is a bit of a theme, the, the hero's journey. And I hope these episodes are inspiring you on your own hero's journey. So let's dive in now and meet Jolyon. I decided on this one to leave a little bit of the banter in at the beginning, so I hope you like it. Little clap for the the cameras. Nice night. Um, So, yeah, Jolyon, how, how, uh, well, I'll let you, I'll let you take a few puffs there first. (laughs) Smoking uh, lots of CBD weed at the minute. Oh, wow. It's been really interesting. I've got kind Mm. of, uh, used to really enjoy a blaze when I was younger. But uh-huh. now, um, now I just enjoy the ritual with uh, the bit of hemp. Mm. You, learn, you learn something new every day. I didn't know until a couple of weeks ago that it's actually just the male plant. Mm. So the female plant actually carries the THC, and the mm. male plant uh, carries the um, carries new economic benefits. Amazing! It's a whole new. I, I, well, we'll get to it later about your um, Instagrams. Yeah, that was. <laughs> And a potential business opportunity. Wow. You, 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 you actually have seen some of my work. Oh, um, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Sorry, maybe I should close these windows because I'm suddenly worried about sound. Okay. Yeah, no worries. Um, and then I promise you that will be the last false start. That's okay. Sorry, I've come straight out of a writer's meeting. So I sort of like literally finished the writer's meeting, had mm. a quick bit, <laughs> <laughs> sat down again. <laughs> and uh, and after sh- I'm going to shoot my mouth off as as per usual. Um, so let's um, let's listen, bro. Let's let's genuinely let's just let's just begin however you want, whatever yeah. you want, and we'll just flow through. Yeah. Cool. Sounds cool. good. Okay. Hey, Jolyon, how you doing? Hi. Yeah, good. Nice to uh, nice to meet you. Yeah, and you. I've been uh, a fan of your stuff for a long time, so it's been great to be able to chat to you in this format today. Oh, that's um, great. You're obviously a really confident performer in your characters and through your work and everything else. And I was watching a thing recently. Um, you were giving advice to young people. And one of the things you said was you've got to know your voice, find your voice and know your voice. Yeah. So tell me, as a young lad, you know, what, have you always been so confident with your voice or uh, was that a bit of a journey for you? Mm. Yeah, that's a good, a good question. I do believe that people find their voices at different times um, by meeting almost magical entities in their life. Uh, A mutual friend of ours, Mm. Matt Wakeham, was actually the first person to introduce me to the work of Joseph Campbell. I don't know if you're aware of Yeah, the hero's journey and all that. Exactly, the hero's journey and the idea that anyone embarking on any journey the, of spiritual reward ends up meeting uh, and moving into the magical realm through a 
sort of let's just call him Obi Wan for, for, <laughs> for, for the sake of the podcast. It's like a, a guide or a mentor type figure, right? Yeah, definitely. And for me, that was to an extent my grandfather, which I'll, I'll talk about, uh, but also a history teacher. And this particular history teacher, um, I was doing history GCSE at the time. And he took me to a place called Conway Hall. He didn't take anyone else. He he, he asked me to come with him. Um, and Conway Hall is in Red Lion Square in London. I know. It's yeah. I went to a rally. Uh, and at the time, um, uh, Indonesia had just invaded the very small islands of East Timor. And this was a, a conflict I knew nothing about. This was an island whose history I knew nothing about, and frankly, people who I didn't really connect to or care about. And I remember at the time being like, what, what am I doing here? This is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And on this stage that day were Caroline Lucas, Jeremy Corbyn, John Pilger, and Tony Benn. And I remember Corbyn got up and spoke, and you know, I mean, he was all right. It certainly didn't particularly move me. Um, and then Caroline Lucas spoke. And there was something about the empathy she elicited for people who had been disenfranchised that touched me. And then Tony Benn spoke. And I think he's probably still to this day, you know, one of, if not the strongest orators that you will ever come across. And what I remember more than anything about the words was the tone. And the tone was impassioned empathy. And it was a sense of understanding that part of our social contract, not to the nation state, not to a government, but to humanity, is caring about other people. And I believe it was the first time that the phrase was used, which I use a lot when I talk to people, which is, some people's journey is about social capital and looking after other people rather than private capital and looking after yourself. Mm. Something about that really resonated with me. What age and were you at this time? I think I was probably about 14, 15. And it had, a, it had quite a profound effect on me. I'd always been a, a very impressionable kid i was bullied when i was a kid i was dyslexic i was always the kid who'd like make friends with kids in the other class or you know wouldn't understand the sort of secret rules of the playground that were going along and i was not particularly academically um successful at that point so i had you know spelling tests absolutely terrified me you know i was i was i was you know i, I really struggled with believing that you know, I I was probably I probably was stupid. I probably was, you know. But I would always had a voice, and I've been pretty good with words. And I, I'd also never really feared adults. I'd never I never I always had a kind of healthy distaste for authority. Uh -huh. Um, but there was something about what he was saying that resonated to me far beyond the situation that he was talking about, and right into the core, because I think especially when you're in your early teenage years, you really are going like, what is this all about? Um, what am I even doing here? Who am I? And it was something I heard, uh, I, I was actually listening yesterday to Eckhart Tolle talking to Russell Brand, and he yeah. said, I thought it was really brilliant. He said, spiritual teaching isn't about teaching you anything um, that you need to learn. Spiritual teaching is about uh, pointing the way. Mm -hmm. It's just about pointing the way. It's it's a direction of travel, and that definitely affected my um, direction of travel. In Finding a big your way. voice, yeah, and I think that's a really good point you make because uh, if it doesn't become your own journey, and you're doing it because someone else, you know, like if they're pointing the way, but you have to walk the path, right? You've got to do it, and ultimately, sure. otherwise, it's it, it it's not sustainable, right? Mm. Um, so what was it like uh, at home? Were you, uh, you mentioned you were comfortable with adults. Were you, would you have conversations about stuff? My mum was, uh, uh, edited books and which was quite probably frustrating having a dyslexic child that always wanted to be read to uh, <laughs> rather than read himself. And my dad, my dad was less political. He was uh, in the music industry. Um, but you know, there was a lot of mu He played a lot of music, and so did my mum. It's just like you know, everything from Stones to the Beatles to the Birds to Charlie Parker, 
you know, um, James, first time I ever heard a James Brown record, Michael Jackson, you know, a big effect on me. But, I, I, you know, I do think it's important to say this because, you know, the egoic mind is such that at the time, um, you know, really, you know, I haven't done quite a lot of therapy. I really understand this, I think, much more on a, a profound level. You know, I, I really just wanted attention. You know, I wanted it to be about me. I wanted to be recognized. I wanted to be validated. I wanted to be sated. I wanted to be mm-hmm. understood. And in the world that we're currently living in, um, which I think is far more, um, this is now f- far more sort of hyper, uh, you know, extended Magnified or whatever, yeah. Than it, than it was now through social media and stuff. You know, I was a product of advertising in the 80s. You know, I was a child who was being told through, you know, movies, through television shows, even through cartoons like He-Man and, 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 and <laughs> Transformers, that it was about leadership, that it was about heroes, that it was about ultra masculinity, that it was about um, you, and it was about people saving the day. And it was, and, and also what the reason that I became interested in history, the reason I became interested in politics was because of an absolute obsession with Americana. You know, it was American movies, it was American TV shows, it was about, um, you know, those impossible um, Hollywood fairy tale notions of love, Hollywood fairy tale notions of, you know, um, um, you know, success. Um, and when I started doing history GCSE, I must have exuded that because the first thing we studied was JFK. Mm-hmm. And I remember suddenly a cog turning. And, you know, there's a brilliant um, David, uh, uh, David David Mitchell. David oh, yeah. and, uh, uh, does an amazing sketch where he, he's dressed up in a Nazi uniform and he goes, are we, are we the bad guys? You know, and there's this amazing moment where, where if you're doing any kind of, you know, critical analysis of, um, you know, the nation state and active realities of that, 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 then it does dawn on you that your own conditioning is, is, is playing a part in that narrative. I talk often um, at the minute about the kind of, um, the, this, this sort of football chant version of popular history, which is really, you know, two world wars and one world cup. And that our entire popular narrative is based on this edifice of understanding that we, 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 the nation, Britain, are good uh, in a very kind of binary world. They were bad. We defeated bad, so we must be good. And therefore, uh, t- to some extent, um, uh, you know, beyond, um, uh, beyond repute. Everything is justified, right? Because we, 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 we saved the day kind of thing. We good over evil, that uh, kind of narrative. Yeah. Yeah. And it's important to note at this point that, you know, as, as we talk now, you know, 46% of uh, young people were leaving school at 16, uh, in, even in 2005, that there's a very understandable, um, uh, notion that when you read a newspaper, you are reading the news. Uh, and therefore, why should you question the narrative? They must be telling the truth. And, you know, papers like the Daily Mail paper and t- tabloids like The Sun then ruthlessly exploit this lack of critical thinking to sate and, um, in most cases, sort of brutally, um, you know, attack vulnerable groups in society and other them uh, in order to uh, inflate one's own sense of righteousness. And I mean that because, um, you know, as a regular victim of of trolling that has increased exponentially since the Brexit referendum and the build-up to the Brexit referendum. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this was, you know, I believe that British society was absolutely purposefully gamed. You know, we were, you know, data sets were studied, you know, touch points were, uh, nerve endings, if you like, were um, understood mm-hmm. and then ruthlessly attacked, you know, doing okay. gender- can I ask you your opinion on that? Because I've I've um, had a um, I guess you know looked at some of the similar stuff that you've looked at, and it does seem that is the case. But it I can't figure out why. Like like when you, you say know, why why what exactly like like why um, what would be like if we think it was a clever master plan to kind of let's just say do that well, for what purpose like all, well, what, all the purpose. Uh, I think you need to look at, uh, I mean, firstly, if, if people haven't, I would strongly recommend following Carol Cadwallader, uh, who's a, a Guardian investigative journalist who's mm-hmm. been previously attacked since she started bringing up the links between um, uh, Vote Leave, 
dark money pools uh, and surprise, surprise, uh, um, you know, Russia. You know, there is a, a wonderful book actually called 10 Maps that explain geopolitics. I'll actually, I'll, I'll bring it up later. I think it's in my mm. room. I get it. Yeah. And you must always remember that the realities are that Russia have, has wanted for generations to disembowel the pop the, the the ability for the the traditional west if you like the second world west nato the european union the united states um and those countries who part who are part of the commonwealth um to basically stop their effectiveness um and uh there is a very very uh, esteemed journalist called luke harding who is a russian specialist um, who wrote uh, a book on the matter and who has spoken um, even in the last couple of weeks to The Guardian about how, why have we not seen the Russia reports in this country? What could it possibly uh, show us? And what Luke um, uh, has, has the reports that Luke has seen, and, you know, this, this also comes as a result of the now discredited um you know am i well not discredited because it's totally legit but the, the, donald trump did his best to discredit it uh mi5 file that became extremely famous uh you know a couple of years ago which showed that there was a very strong possibility that the president of the united states was compromised um by russian compromat and if you don't understand that jargon compromat is basically compromising material that could be used to manipulate. Um, now, when you talk about why, um, we we can't just talk about, and a lot of things we will talk about over this thing is about uh, systemics, it's systemic issues, um, and uh, the, the global global economic system, which you know is obviously is commonly referred to as just capitalism. But basically, what it is is it's about the profit motive. It's about the idea, the ascendancy to almost the deity, to deifying this idea that um, profit at all costs, quarterly returns, um, profit uh, uh, you know, for, for the sake of profit, is our guiding society. A measure of success, yeah. Well, it's not just a measure of success. It's it's a, it's a rationale. You see, it's it's not just you know when they cut um, funding for women's shelters or for international aid or for um, you know social care or you know even um, in a much more rudimentary way uh, uh, you know issue extra tuition for children at state schools who who like me was struggling with dyslexia. It's not. It's not just because it, it's success. It's because the market. It's because we can't afford it, and and that would be fine if there was an actual, um, you know, necessity monetarily to do it. But most of the time, it's ideological rather yeah. than actually about the funds. Mm. So, do you think that? Um let's say the Russia angle is 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 exactly what's happening. Do you think then that people, Trump and the British uh, leaders are completely bumbling along as pawns in this game or are they in on it as far as you're aware? I think, I think again, we have to be, so when we say in on it, I don't think there is a grand master plan. I think the Russian state has uh, always used every instrument at its disposal to try to uh, mm. legal and illegal through its intelligence services, just as we have, just as the Americans have, Everybody to, is, yeah. to push its own agenda. That's the first thing. The second thing is, though, that when you um, look at any reason why an issue has happened, and I think in this podcast, hopefully we'll talk about Extinction Rebellion, we'll talk about Black Lives Matter, talk about the nature of my work and how I got into that generally. Mm -hmm. It's always the same truism, which is follow the money, right? Following the money means you can at least uh, be clear that there is a trail which would suggest that there is no such thing as a free lunch. So when, mm -hmm. for instance, a political party takes a 50,000 pound donation from JCB, JCB are, the owner of JCB is, is, is one of the, historically the biggest donors to the Conservative Party. Mm. It's probably because he wants access to contracts that will hugely financially benefit him. Likewise, a lot of the people who are pushing or had been pushing for a long time for a hard Brexit 
are the same people who um, are betting on a run on the pound, the devaluation of it, and shorting the market. If, if I'm not going to go into what all no, I understand. Yeah, it's, it's almost like purely chess moves in a way, like where the day-to-day the -day yeah. living won't affect them. They'll, they'll be okay whether the economy is, appears to be good or bad for average people, but they're, they're playing a bigger economic game, right? That, that's totally it. And, that, and that's why when you see people like Jacob Rees-Mogg, who is in the House of Parliament, decrying people who are standing in the way of democracy, um, you know, you have to read, you have to be a, a certain sort of uh, level of political geek to read in private eye that he's spent the last three months setting up a private investment fund in Ireland, which is a notable tax haven in order to, um, you know, essentially, mm. you know, feather his own, his own bed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, not at all, not in any way to, um, to compare to those sort of wealthy guys. Um, but, but at the same time, it's become, you've talked about it being an advantage, sort of using your white privilege. So you went to a private school, I guess it's quite expensive. So you could, in one sense, argue, you know, you're still one of the posh white boys. Oh, but sure. same, for, right. So, but, but obviously you've uh, had a long history of using that um, to kind of shine up, mm. put a mirror or to challenge power and so on, which is, which is brilliant. And, and, and I'd love to, you to just share a little bit about how sure. I mean, that has given you the access. Sorry, sorry, yeah. John. That yeah, that yeah. Has, that that's given you the access because, you know, you're there, people watching, like I, we'll talk a bit about the revolution we were televised. I loved it. I just cannot tell oh, you how much I totally loved it. Um, and you're, you're thinking like, how the hell did they get in there? And you're up there, you know, all right, you know, uh, David, you know, this and that. And it's because you talk like that and look like that, that there you've probably got in there. So tell us a bit about that, how you've used so, it. Uh, yeah. So the first thing to say is that, um, I would consider, you know, my family as basically being a sort of classic lower middle class North London Guardian reading uh, household um, who, like I said, my dad was in the music industry um, and my mum was in publishing. But it was actually thanks to my granddad that I could afford to go to a school called King Alfred's. Now, King Alfred's is far from your normal private school. King Alfred's is a school that is no uniform, where the, it's a very sort of arts-based curriculum and where the- Mixed as well, isn't it? Both boys and girls too. Yeah, it's mixed. Absolutely. I've never, ever not been to a mixed school. I went to a mixed primary school. I went to a mixed uh, secondary school. Um, I had my first kiss in a, a, a chemistry lab, you know, <laughs> but very standard fair. Um, but it's, um, it was Steiner principles. And the principles of Rudolf Steiner, and I think this is something I'm absolutely fascinated by, a wonderful man who I'm very lucky to know a little bit, Ken Robinson, who's an educational psychologist. Mm -hmm. And that's been the most wonderful thing about my work is I've come into contact with so many luminaries in their fields who I've, I've been very lucky to learn from. And I really believe this, that a lot of the, the, the issues that we currently face are about being at an age where your bias is yet to be cemented and to be confronted by information. And the amazing democratizing force of things like YouTube, hopefully this podcast and many others, is that you are now able to access a lot of information that was before seen as quite privileged. So the, the truth is after doing, after I went to university and I studied politics and international relations, and I was very lucky in that period of time to go through two things. So Sussex was a sort of university where if you walked through Library Square, you would be confronted by people who initially you thought were absolutely crazy, to be honest, talking about Coca-Cola bottling plants in Columbia, where when trade union lines were, were, were broken, sorry, when picket lines uh, were broken by workers, um, and then they finally cemented this protest because they were getting paid so badly. Paramilitaries were hired uh, uh, and, and, you know, the, the rest is history. If you want to look at, if you want to look that up for a bit, people just have a look at Plan Colombia or you know Killer Cola. You, you'll have a look at that. Also, by issues about you know Palestinian statehood, about uh, sanctions against Cuba, and particularly about sanctions against Iraq. Now, I remember very vividly. I'd done politics A level. I walked into a talk, and I remember saying, "Listen, it's ridiculous the idea that Tony Blair or Bill Clinton would give Saddam Hussein an inch." 
And this guy looked at me with very, very sad eyes. And he just kind of was like, I could see in his face, he was like, I could try and get into this with you, but I'm not going to. What I then learned was as a result of sanctions that the UK were working on, one of the things that Iraq had been deprived was um, powdered milk. And this had had a profound impact on child mortality. I heard about this, yeah. And this was, and this, these are just anecdotal things that started building up. And then also when I was at university, 9-11 happened. And I became absolutely fascinated by what had happened because, you know, just like most, you know, uni kids at the time, I'd watched the Zeitgeist movie on YouTube. I, I wanted to know what was going on. I, you know, it's watched all the conspiracy films. And in fact, it was the first time where I realized how dangerous online conspiracies could be, because what I was also academically learning was that, um, and I spent, I actually did this for my dissertations, which was Al Qaeda and the war on terrorism, was that Al Qaeda in Arabic meant base, and that MAC, which was basically an organization funded through the um, uh, through Mossad, through the, the CIA, through uh, our own MI6 was actually supposed to basically create a network of formerly disparate Islamic extremists who were supposed to be uh, in the conception of the idea, which was by a Jordanian cleric, sorry, a Palestinian cleric called Dr. Hazan, uh, a sort of Arab rapid response force, a bit like NATO. Now, at the time, Osama bin Laden, um, who was, if you go to anywhere in in, in, in the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia, you will see the name Bin Laden all, all over construction sites because it's very similar to sort of Travis Perkins in terms of its scale and visibility. And uh, he came from a very wealthy family and he put money into that. And he fell under the influence of the leader of Egyptian Islamic Jihad, who was a man called Al Zuhari, who is now popularly known as, as the leader of, of ISIS. And he basically completely disagreed with Hazam's where he didn't, Hazam did not believe in terrorism whatsoever. And he killed Sam in a car bombing and took Bin Laden under his wing and essentially really sort of groomed him to become, you know, the leader of, you know, what he called the, the Mujahideen and eventually the, uh, the, the the fighters. And also then at that point in my life, I, I moved to New York for a year um, uh, to go to university over there. And I, I didn't go to a, a posh university. I went to a place called SUNY Stony Brook, which was basically... Uh, in the middle of Long Island, it was like a, a, an Amtrak, a 7-Eleven and a Dunkin' Donuts. It was not it was not like my what I thought, where I thought I was going. And I was pretty despondent at this time. And um, completely by chance, Noam Chomsky was doing a visiting professorship in linguistics. <laughs> and because Chomsky, we weren't an Ivy League school. If you don't know, the Ivy League universities are like Yale, um, Fordham, Harvard, Princeton, and they get everything. Yeah, they get all the talking, you know forty thousand dollars a term. It is a it is mm -hmm. a totally tiered society, um, and so very few people turned up. So I started having this really unusual, very extremely privileged contact with someone who you may. Uh, have huge problems with Chomsky, and uh, there are huge problems with with Noam Chomsky, I, I believe. Um, but it, it, it was a fascinating person to learn from, and I learned a lot because mainly I learned through my ear. But I also learned something very important in that time. I went to his office. He was extrapolating out about you know the realities of, of uh, the means of violence outside of the nation state, and he was talking and he. he was making coffee except it was kind of instant coffee and he passed me this cup of coffee and i started to drink it and it was just cold water with <laughs> granules in it and i realized i remember realizing very very strongly that like, how is it possible that this guy who i consider to be a, a genius doesn't know how to put hot water in a glass to make coffee and there's something really profoundly important there because you see we're all different and i i find the idea of intelligence as such very disturbing because you know it's a it's it's often used as a way to other other people to to, to say your the people's viewpoint is is ridiculous you often hear i mean constantly on twitter he's an idiot this person's an idiot this person you know people are people are different um mm. and intelligence manifests in all sorts of ways i am very lucky that i've had a lot of stuff reflected to me and then i could curate information that was coming into me which is a key point of mental health nowadays, and I want to talk about that later. Um, but also, I'm just a strong orator. You know, you should see me trying to change a light bulb. It's it's a it's a nightmare. 
you know, <laughs> not a very practical person. So I think it's really important that, you know, people understand that. Mm. And so you, you're in New York, you know, you, as you said, you've got lots of inspiring inputs. You've got a lot of things going around your head. How mm. do you get from that point? So I guess you're what, 20, tw early 20s at that stage? Yeah, so I was 20, I was 21. I came home and then I had a profoundly challenging experience, which was that I almost died. And I had oh, a really? cyst that basically perforated on my bowel and my spleen, so shut them both down. And I had a peritonitis, which is essentially when they cut you open pretty much from the top of your chest down to your, your, your belly button. Um, I was felt very emasculated by the whole experience and I felt very vulnerable. And at that point I spent three weeks coalescing with my, uh, with my granddad and my grandma because my parents um, had gone off for a family holiday with my brother. And there was a lot of change in that period of time, a lot of, a lot of really understanding stuff. And my granddad once said to me in the morning, he said, you know, you've just got to get stuck into something. And then basically I spent most of my 20s not getting stuck into things or trying to get stuck into things and not having that much success. So I was extremely lucky very early on. My first professional acting job was with uh, Chris Morris and Charlie Brooker mm. on Nate Barley. And that was like an amazing experience because Chris and Sasha Baron Cohen and Monty Python had really been like my comedy heroes. So to be on set with Chris Morris was extremely like powerful but i was also so in my own egoic mind at the time that it was still all about me you know i was i was stuck i just couldn't believe i was around these people but it wasn't i wish i'd i wish i'd you know as we always do you know if i had that time again yes I would and were, were they um did you get to have any chats with them um yeah. it's, it's a funny thing isn't it uh when you have especially as a as a man i think you know um, male people that you look up to, sometimes it can be really awkward trying to kind of connect with them or whatever. How, how was the experience and how were they with you? Well, I mean, I, I basically uh, made a total prat of myself. We went to, <laughs> it was more at the rap party where I basically turned up thinking I was some kind of cool extra in a Justin Timberlake video. Uh, <laughs> and Charlie saw me and I remember thinking, I could just see in his eyes, I was like, oh God, this guy's an idiot. And, um, and it was only when the show really came out, because you never get all the scripts, that I realized it really is about the rise of the idiots, and I actually am one of them. Oh. Um, and uh, no, but seriously, I mean, when you when you do any work with someone like that, you know, Chris, his way of auditioning people was to throw them into an improvisation with absolutely zero preparation. So I literally walked in, he's like, right, so we're in Amsterdam, uh, you're, in a, you, you, you're a singer, you're in the booth, uh, but just before you've got in the booth, you've got your guitar and you've racked up three massive lines of coke. Uh, I'm interviewing you. You give me a couple of lines. You go, you, uh, you give me a bit of chat, you go into the booth, you sing, you come out and I've done all the lines. Go. Okay. You know, and you're like, fucking hell. I mean, this is Chris Morris here. It's better be quite good. Anyway, it can't have been too bad because he gave me a part in the end. But it was a very, you know, it was also, as I'll talk about later on, like, understanding him and, and and channeling him was a, a big part about making this this show happen and then actually that was a very interesting thing you know because you you have a lot of really powerful in what seemed like i guess started as improvised characters you know i was yeah. just as you were talking there about the lines of coke i was thinking about the dutch guy i don't know his name you know double, yeah, fish TV. Gun, double yeah. Fish. yeah 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 and that kind of thing so how did you to fill me in uh from from that first job obviously must have you must have felt very enthused that actually yeah maybe i can maybe here's something i can break into maybe here's something yeah, exactly. else, getting the I, chance. yeah i thought i thought it was worth giving a go so i I'd, I'd signed with this agent as a result i went to the next audition after you know my last sort of party night with my uni friends because we were leaving uni um and i totally fucked up the audition I, I was like i didn't even really audition i just i just asked the director loads of questions about why he was doing what he was doing which if you are an actor is not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to go in, do your lines perfectly and fuck off because they got the next person coming. But I didn't get this. And I also didn't get what a good opportunity it was because it was at the old Vic. It was like quite a big play. Um, and that kind of was like, my agent at the time was like, I could see it was just like, this guy doesn't understand what the fuck he's doing. So he suggests I go to Drama Center. Now Drama Center is a serious conservatoire. And if that sounds wanky, 
it, it isn't. It's about the idea of an art. Now, the best example of this is like, I can put together an Ikea table, but I'm certainly not a craftsman. Um, my uncle, you know, God rest his soul, was, was a carpenter. And, you know, there's a world of difference. Um, and then I started to really think about what, what, what this work could be and what, what, it, what it can do and the power of storytelling, the power of standing up to people, the power of making people laugh and stuff like that. And at the time, I just wanted to do uh, drama. And then I got into a real FUD in my life. I, I kind of just didn't, I'd worked with a film company. I'd, I'd started a small production company. I would made a couple of short films with BFI, but I'd never really broken through. And then th there wasn't enough money for the company to continue. And I ended up basically working like a grandized telly sales at the Financial Times. Mm. Um, and I just was like, what am I doing with my life? How did you feel? Because that you must be getting to your late twenties, sort of, yeah, maybe, maybe I, nearly thirty. How, how did you? How did that feel for you? Because obviously, you're a guy with big ambition. Low, extremely low, re real uh, lack of um, belief in the the basic idea that you know anyone would take me seriously or my ideas seriously. And that's when I I first started to go to therapy. And if I hadn't done therapy, I would never have done the revolution would be televised because the basic core thing that came back was self-sabotage was you are self-sabotaging and, and if you don't understand what that really means what, what it what it essentially is is that you may have a thought or a hope or a desire to do something that's your first voice that's your egoic mind and the id your second voice will go no but you you're shit at that you know mm. you'll be able to do that you shit oh don't 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 try don't because it's going to be embarrassing. Now, a lot of people in my life still, a lot of people who need therapy the most, a lot, a lot of people who are, are, you know, totally a hostage to their own mental health um, will never, ever make that distinction that I'm trying to make here. And it's about observing your mind. It's about pulling back and, and sitting with yourself and seeing. And that's something that, you know, I'm, I'm not practicing that much, but I'm a huge believer in, in meditation and yoga and, you know, those those things that allow one to sit back. And particularly for people like me who have an extremely busy mind, it's mm -hmm. it's very important. But so I did the therapy. Sorry. No, no, it's just, I was just going to say, was there, you, you go into it as little or as much as you feel comfortable to, but did you in that process um, uncover anything that you felt was... Um, was extenuating that or had sort of like how did you tackle that how did you tackle what, overcoming what, that voice what what had happened was that essentially you know look we are all we are all children you know mm. and we our, our inner child we basically but by the time you're about you know five to to, to you know nine years old you're, you're almost a fully formed person but there are layers of things that have taken place and my father um, had been a musician up until he was 30. He trained then for nine years to become a lawyer. My mum, who'd reached board level at an uh, you know, editing company, um, wanted to be a stay-at-home mum. But basically, when my dad decided to go back to, 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 to law school, um, she had to work, which meant I then basically spent a lot of my formative, very early years with my godparents and my godson now they lived in a totally different reality to us we were a middle class family with with books on the, the walls they were a working class family living just off um uh, camden square in york rise if you know that part of camden it's unbelievably mixed and it was a different world and it was a world that somehow i was a part of i wasn't jolly in there i was jolly you know, and it was uh, it was a house that was completely the opposite of mine. It was like people in and out all the time. And instead of books on the walls, it was literally walls and walls of VHSs. It's where I got into Star Wars. It's where I got into Superman, Spider-Man, um, you know, uh, The Exorcist, which I really shouldn't have seen, Candyman, all <laughs> sorts of movies. My whole movie vernacular was, was from there. And it was understanding that on some level, the pattern of behavior that I had been um, utilizing, the tools that I had were not serving me anymore and that I needed to embrace another side of my life and to f forgive the, the inner child and to look after the inner child and to then 
uh, unleash its potential. And that started for me in a very direct way. I had gone to a meeting at Hattrick Productions. Hattrick make, have I got news for you? They make a uh, phone jacker, mm. face jacker. I was kind of in awe of the place. I met this guy. We talked about various ideas. And we left the meeting with him saying, well, you know, there's this panel show coming up and maybe you can do some writing on it kind of thing. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, amazing. And I was actually listening recently to a commencement speech that the Obamas give to all the new graduates and Beyonce was speaking. Beyonce being the living reality of Mother Gaia, spirit animal that, that currently roams the earth. And she said this very powerful thing that really spoke to me, which is, if you don't have a stage, build your own. And I remember being at the FT and Hayden and Joe, Hayden Prowse and Joe Wade, Hayden I'd gone to school with, Joe I'd known from university, had been practicing this type of comedy activism. So for them, it was like stunts. So when there was, uh, you know, the, the sketch actually you talked about a referenda cunt, they made uh, MI5 uh, the biggest torture club in town by sort of trying to make it torture garden to highlight at the time, a policy called extraordinary rendition, which was the abduction and illegal transfer of someone from one country to another. Um, they had done a sketch called GBFNYC, which was give us back our fucking money, you cunts. Yeah, uh, so. outside that. And they, it was doing really, it was amazing. I was so amazed that Hayden was doing these things. Um, and at one point he just called me up and he was like, look, what about you know doing what you did sort of with Chris Morris? What about doing that kind of thing? And I at this time I had totally a hundred percent given up acting. I had just I had gone from my life. So you were in the you were in the FT job uh, yeah. at this point, feeling pr a pretty not a good place, right? Particularly totally, totally low, not self actualized in any way, not following my re my real path. Very. Very, very um, disenfranchised from my from my spirit, from my soul, mm. and um, we started doing these videos. Well, I was basically some form of character that I'd come up with. It was at one point we did the Tory and a Lib Dem. At another point, I really was obsessed with the fact that Occupy Wall Street had just happened. So when Occupy started in the UK, I decided to do Fox News UK. And this was literally me and Hayden. And this is another turning point because this was before TV. It's just a guy and a camera. And at the time, the the joke was that the right was reporting these things like it's anarchy, it's chaos over here. When actually, yeah. it was incredibly calm, incredibly quiet. People were really listening to each other. Was that and the beginning so, of um, Was that the beginning of Dale Maley? It was the very first thing, yeah. And he and we had a moment where everything was quiet. There were about probably five thousand people just sitting outside of they tried to occupy the, the stock exchange that hadn't worked they pushed them out uh to to the the the, the church by in the square oh yeah and occupy yeah i remember yeah me and i was dressed in a i had a uh, a flat jacket on and i had a helmet on and we sort of looked at each other and it was like are we going to fucking do this are we going to are we going to do this and we just charged through this totally calm i mean you can still see it on the youtube video people are just like shocked and i'm literally running through screaming like it's anarchy here it's total chaos things are cut money as we know it is being destroyed money as we know it might not and the re response was just crazy people jumping up like what is going on who's this lunatic and then a policeman came over <clears throat> and just because i was so adrenalized i thought i can use this guy as a prop yeah. so i just used him as, as like the straight man in a sketch and it was it worked and it went viral um it was everywhere for like a week and charlie brooker started tweeting about it. people started tweeting about it. and i started thinking this is good but at the time i was still self-sabotaging i still hadn't got to that point where I thought it was good so what i did was i decided in one email to put together three links from the work mm -hmm. and then because i think that's important especially if you're going to make a tv show or something you need to already demonstrate success and that's what a lot of people don't understand about what the, the potential of how to use YouTube and stuff, and now TikTok, Vimeo, um, Instagram. And then I attached a one page. And literally within five minutes of sending that email, he sent one back saying, This who is. Who did you send it to? Huh? Oh, I sent it to the guy at Hattrick who I'd met. Mm -hmm. And he was like, This is really exciting. You've got to come in. So we did go in. And we actually went in for our first meeting. We'd been shooting another sketch because the coalition basically done uh, this idea of the big society that because of the government cuts. I remember uh, that. Yeah. Had to step in. So we did the, the coalition's BS and we got youths to sweep the, the, the carpet, the, the, the floor. 
And we happened to completely randomly, and it was completely random, knock on Jonathan Miller's door. Now, if you don't know who Jonathan Miller is, he is one of the doyens of British comedy. He, he was around uh, and very formative in, with, with formative, sorry, with people like the Pythons. And he just gave us the best material we'd ever had because we were like, hello, sir. Just wondering if you could, you know, if you could spare a couple of chains. Like, I hate you a lot. You're cunts. I mean, this is an 85 year old man. You know, this, this was amazing. And we walked into Hattrick, both with these rosettes on, still in our costume. Oh, so you were James and Barnaby, were you at that stage? Yeah, well, they weren't James and Barnaby at the time, but yes, yes, we, we were. And um, this guy, Richard Wilson, walked in, who's the executive producer of Have I Got News For You, Time Memorial. And he was like, are you two for real? Like, are you, what are you doing here? And we were like, sorry, we've just been filming. And we met this guy, Jonathan Miller. And he was like, Jonathan Miller? Um, yeah, it was quite something. From that point, it then started a very long journey. And it's really important to, to say this because a lot of the time with any kind of success that seems overnight, mm -hmm. there is a huge, huge growth period and mistakes that are made and stuff like that. So for us, we, I guess, three months after that, managed to get a taster tape from Channel 4. And the taster tape is basically shoot the scene, edit it, show us kind of what it's going to look like. We shot the scene. It went very well. It was actually ended up being the first sketch of the Revolution We Televised, the second sketch, which was in, in Topshop, um, where we did the offshore range. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. But the way, we, we, then, we then went off for two days. It was Hayden's birthday. We decided to get a cheap, easy jet flight. We, we, we went and we did some skiing for two days. When we came back, the edit that we saw was so bad and it was so not what we had expected that first of all we we fought against each other and then we just we looked and we were like we've totally fucked it up because channel 4 rejected it and suddenly it was like wow this is this isn't happening is it and who did the edit uh, was that the something was done in house okay so what it was the lesson that you should have been more involved with it or what, what was the, the lesson, lesson from that? Absolutely, 100%. If you have an idea, you are the person who understands that idea. And often experience can actually count against people because what they will do is they will try to turn it into what they understand. And you may, going back to the Joseph Campbell thing, be in possession of special magical knowledge that, that totally confounds them. And so, what, so what happened then was I basically re-edited it myself. Mm. Uh, I asked for money to do it. There's no money available. Production companies give you all kinds of bullshit. You know, they they, they start saying things like, oh, "We can't set a precedent here." Anyway, yeah. we were also extremely lucky because a guy called Zai Bennett, who had basically been the controller of BBC of ITV and made things like Towie there. Um, was taking over at BBC Three. And a lot of the time, a lot of these things are out of your control. You know, people come and go in jobs that you don't know when you're just starting out massively affect you. And the quality of your product is is, is only part of, um, you know, the, the thing. But Zai, you know, God bless him, came in and after one meeting, commissioned entire series. Which did, was, you, did you know him prior? Or? No, I'd never met him before in my life. I mean, it was one meeting. And it blew my mind because suddenly I was doing exactly what I'd always dreamed about doing, which was I was going to make a television series, which I was going to be one of the two stars of, but I was <laughs> also going to write, you know, was going, to, going to write it. Amazing. And well, how I'm far later was that from when you had the initial, uh, you know, the viral thing and it all looked like it was moving? What's the gap? What's the, how long in between? Yeah a year but we were lucky um and that's when i say that I, I, i'd say it was about a year um that after we had, had really built up some form of body of work and then we made the revolution we televised and that was the most intense period of time in my entire life i can't even begin to really explain the level of commitment and dedication of every member of that team because first of all you need to be able to legally shoot stuff which means standing up the issues documenting the issues anyone who's worked in documentary filmmaking will understand that 
you need to do things like stage ones and stage twos, which prove that you can only, you know, you need to secretly film this. Now, in our case, what we what the revolution we tell us actually was, you know, it's called a hidden camera prank comedy show. What it actually was was using comedic characters to repackage um, investigative journalism that had already been published and to redistribute it to an audience who never would have come into contact with it. It was mm. it was a teaching essentially. It was it was a it was a mass of information. So each episode there were eighteen sketches. Each of those sketches was an issue dressed up as a comedy sketch. And we used to have a bit of a formula because I don't know if you remember the animations in the show, which was super key, like so key. Uh, but the animations basically gave you um, uh, your buy-in. So as an audience, you knew what we what the sketch was about because you may never have heard of corporate tax avoidance. You may never have heard of, um, you know, issues with the Qatari government. You know, you may never have heard of, uh, you know, females in Saudi Arabia not being able to drive illegally. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's still, you know, that first ever episode of the show is probably the thing I'm, you know, creatively still one of the things I'm certainly most proud of. We, we, it, it didn't hold back and we managed to get it through. And that meant totally trouncing absolutely every single, you know, wall that exists between jobs. So you have an editor, you have an executive producer, you have a producer, you have someone who deals with it. And, you know, we would constantly be told, don't worry about that. And we said, no, 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 but we are worried about that. And everything from the interstitials to the graphics packages, to the title sequence, to the to the music, to the pacing of beats of a sketch, mm. we, we decided to sit on every department. And that made us extremely unpopular. But the interesting thing is, is that it it's because it was evidently, and often this is where the best work comes from, a much more than just because TV is can be very very formulaic. Just churn it out, do it like this, chip chop chop. It, it, it was it was a it was something of your very being, right? It was it was art, really. It was like a huge expression rather than oh, let's just do a sort of a, a really magazine show. Say, like really really kind of you to say. And one of the things that had made the entire team think I was absolutely insane. <laughs> was at the, on the very first day and it, t- you got to understand this industry you know these are tv freelancers they move from job to job they're working mm-hmm. on cooking shows they're working on entertainment shows great people though was very lucky with my team mm-hmm. and it was me hayden and it was my best friend from university errol who was spiritually a huge guide to me and i said look guys this is more than just the tv show you know we're advocating on the behalf of the disenfranchised and the vulnerable and we're going to win a BAFTA. We're going to fucking win a BAFTA. We're going to make something so powerful. And people were like, this guy is off his fucking tits. This guy, <laughs> this guy is on a mad messiah complex, stupid. It's a, it's a hidden camera prank show for BBC Three. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, the first episode came out. And I knew as soon as the first episode came out, I, I got all my friends, my family, all Hayden's friends and family, which we, because we went to university together, went to school together, into this teeny, teeny pub, uh, bar, cocktail bar, a friend of mine run in Kensal Rise. And we all were there. And I just could feel the reactions. Before it started, there was an unbelievable sense of nervousness because I'm oh, yeah. pretty sure that at least 80% of them thought it would be shit. <laughs> Really? Yeah, I mean, not in a terrible way. It's just like when you go to see your mate at a gig, you're like, I really hope they're good. Um, yeah, yeah. But it was, it was just, it was really powerful. And then the first Guardian review came out. It was like, you know, it's, it's Sasha Baron Cohen or Mark Steele, but a bit more intelligent. And da, da, da. and that and that changed everything because suddenly there was a huge upsurge because it went from people at the BBC who'd been terrified when we, you know, given George Osborne a GCSE maths textbook and they were getting complaints from Conservative Party HQ to, aren't we clever? Um, we've made a, a, a real, you know, monumental piece. Mm-hmm. And it's a very strange thing when that happens because you're suddenly then catapulted into all kinds of situations that you're not really ready for. Um, yes. Especially if you are a, you know, um, someone who's been bullied as a kid and has certain vulnerabilities and, and definitely a sense to be needed to be, to be seen. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, uh, but it was, it was, the, it was, you know, a fundamental bedrock of, of our career and, and we worked together for years after that you know we made three series of the revolutionary televised then we made two specials 
then we made revolting then we moved to channel four and made ministry of justice mm. uh, you know I must, and now, I'm, now i'm writing i must say um i i really want to say it to you it, it was absolutely genius i loved it so much and i was just watching back today you know uh before we were going to chat some of the stuff <laughs> it just it gets you viscerally especially for people who you know like this podcast is is aimed at people who are like you know uh seekers searchers dreamers thinkers you know people like that you know uh it really uh, hits the spot so you know massive hey. massive massive congrats yeah. I mean, listen, I, I really want to be clear here. You know, the idea of that type of comedy activism really came from Hayden Prowse. You know, mm. Hayden is, uh, he understood on a very profound level the power of jeopardy. So jeopardy is what you really get in the real world that you can't possibly get anywhere else. But what I think I had was this sort of argumentative, almost profound sort of mental illness where I would just keep pushing further <laughs> and further and further. And it's like, this is why I said, this is why I brought up the Occupy thing. Because when we when we charged through those people, that was the first time where it was like, there is no spoon. And it's a bit, it's a bit like realizing that you could just drive along at a red and you'd never get a ticket. And, you know, you talked about my whiteness earlier and, and the privilege. Mm. We basically racially profiled ourselves. We looked at ourselves and we were like, we can do things that other people can't do if we get access and that is key because you have to have the access because remember this isn't stuff to put online this is stuff to put on the bbc this has to be yeah. legally gotta go through all the lawyers and everything yeah all the time and we had unbelievably ag agreed restrictions so for instance i would never be able to interrupt a speech but i could get them on their way up there you know i can't enter a building that they're just about to give a talk in, but I can get them when they get out of their car going into an entrance. You know, it was the, it was literally the sort of, I mean, especially when you're talking about like Donald Trump, Nigel Farage, David Cameron, Boris Johnson, it's, you're talking it's, about a matter of seconds and you mm. take that chance or it's gone. You know, like there's, there's one thing I'll always regret, which is I had Dick Cheney and I let him go in America because- well, did, you, did you just have a moment of doubt or something? No, no, no. He he was he's a very intelligent man, Dick Cheney. We were at an oil and gas conference in uh, Montana, where the world is frankly upside down. You know, I mean, it's like you think that environmental issues are an issue where well, you're going to get burnt at the stake. You know, you don't agree with the Republican Party. Well, get out of here, chap. And um, Cheney saw me coming. That was such a great conversation with Jolly and I really enjoyed talking to him. Make sure you tune into part two, which is available straight away uh, to find out how Cheney expertly uh, kind of got away. Um, we'll also hear from Jolly and about how repressed kind of traumatic experiences that he'd had filming as a character in things like The Revolution Will Be Televised, where people had asked him for help and he wasn't able to help them, really has pushed him to have a shift towards more talking about issues directly. He's got very involved with Black Lives Matter. He talks about that. He also talks about the moment he got the uh, the BAFTA for, for a revolution movie televised with Hayden Prowse and how he felt the next day. And he also talks about self-care. So make sure you tune in for part two. Lots of really great stuff in there. Make sure you subscribe because you'll then get notified about all the other great guests I've got coming up for you. If you can do a rate and review for me, that would be super because it, it helps us to reach more people, but it's also so nice and encouraging for me to read. Um, think of a friend who might like this podcast. I really want to build up a community of us who are uh, trying to evolve and uh, move ourselves forward. So that would, be, that would be amazing. I'll see you in part two. And in the meantime, take care. Thank you.